Rita. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jordan Bruns, and I am here with the incredible uh, Andrew Jansky. Jansky. Uh, uh, I've known now, I, I know he hates me saying this, but we've known each other for now 20 years. Um, he was at uh, the Hopper School of Painting at Maryland Institute College of Art uh, when I was an undergrad. And, um, you know, as a young impressionable artist, I, I think there's nothing more intimidating and awe-inspiring than a uh, very tall, very craft-driven, uh, craft uh, you know, technically gifted artist kind of uh, looming over you. So I think I've been uh, enamored with Drew's painting style for as long as I can remember, almost 20 years now. Um, and then, of course, he... Uh, diverged into many other skills that he has, such as uh, typing all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy over and over again for three days straight. Uh, living, do you want to call it living in a box, Drew? How do you want to say it? Living in a box where uh, video cameras are everywhere, uh, enables so the world can actually watch his daily life. Uh, performing at Elvis's Fight Club, uh, America, what was the America? Celebration of America? <laughs> <laughs> sure. There's so I think, like, all, the performances, I how... all the performances you put on over the years is just like, he's not just a painter, he's also an entertainer. Uh, so when he brings on the charm during his talk today, this is this is part of who he is. So uh, I just want to welcome my, my friend and uh, the god of painting. Uh, <laughs> Drew. <laughs> Thanks hey, for coming. Thanks for the uh, invite. It's always good to hang out, even if digitally. Uh, we haven't spent all that much time communicating in the recent past because you've been off painting landscapes in, in other countries. So uh, yeah, and I gave you a, fa a false uh, phone number. Officially, welcome back to the States. Uh, it's good to see you back in the tower. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here on a Saturday morning with with everybody. I, I genuinely don't know what the other 12 people uh, possibly are doing here. It seems bizarre that you shouldn't be doing, like batting down the hatches for the tropical storm. But hey, uh, I, I do appreciate you being here. And I'm not, I mean, I joke about the audience, but truly I don't know exactly who my audience is this morning. So I deliberately came in without any sort of script. I thought, my website's pretty comprehensive, but at the same time, I didn't want to do some sort of uh, exhaustive chronological lecture about the trials and tribulations of my time in the studio. Um, I'd much rather this be informal. I could maybe focus in on one portion. And then if we have curious minds and they want to, you know, just ask some questions, I'll follow up with some answers. And if this happens for 60 minutes, that's what we're scheduled for, but if it happens in a shorter duration, that's okay too. All this being said, I'm coming to you from a Wi-Fi connection in my new studio and it is unstable. So if I drop out, consider yourself lucky, use that as an excuse to um, leave the meeting and go about your day. Otherwise it's being recorded and I'll do my best not to use too much profanity, although a lot of my artwork is laced with uh, vulgarity, and so is my my persona and my sensibility. So, please, no um, no virgin ears in attendance. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Wojanski. I'm some kid born and raised in Northwest Pennsylvania from a father who was off the boat. He fled World War II, Poland, and uh, he eventually settled in. Appalachia, where he uh, developed an engineering firm. And why that's important is I grew up in his engineering firm and was always uh, exposed to blueprints. Blueprints would end up becoming a repeating motif of mine. Which some pages, I haven't visited in years. Um, but where I'm going with this tangent is that from an early age, I was um, exposed to a lot of engineering blueprints, architectural blueprints, all of the solvents involved, 
and maybe that's affected my brain cells, but it would come back um, decades later to represent themselves with some of my artwork. As Jordan mentioned earlier, I was trained as a traditional painter, an oil painter, but along the way, um, I just found that I wanted to explore other avenues. Uh, I'm going back to an earlier painting. This is from 2005. This is after uh, Jordan and I had left Baltimore. And I don't know if I can enlarge this. I'm sorry, I can't. I'll do it by screen. Um, tableaus of Christian allegory and self portraiture. And it was all very uh, self reflective and narcissistic and kind of a kind of uh, ridiculous. I thought that was the thing to do at the time. I was in my late 20s and I had a beautiful studio space to work in under a graduate program that had um, some pretty stringent demands. And I just worked with a lot of practicality in mind. Namely, I couldn't afford models, so I used myself. And after that very logistic matter was solved, I kind of reverse engineered why the hell I was doing it. Uh, it was truly a means to an end. I was available and willing to put myself in dumb costumes, so I did a series of self-portraits. But then later I said, no, this is all about self-reflection and a God complex. I made them large because I thought that was the thing to get gallery notice. And uh, these, when I say large, I mean, I measured the cargo elevator and figured out I could get a six by eight foot canvas inside of an elevator. Well, then by, I, I make a six by eight foot canvas. You do that for a few years and yeah, you might get some gallery attention, maybe some gallery representation, but uh, then you have these paintings and if they don't go into a collector base, you have a pretty outstanding inventory to deal with. And that's something that I hadn't really considered or, or had been forewarned or had been taught. So now I have this warehouse of humongous canvases with no home to go to. And it was just ridiculous. So I started working smaller and more practical and thinking uh, if I want to find a collector base and have people enjoy my work in their homes, I need to paint things a little more modestly and not be dependent on a gallery selling to a big collector to get it to a museum in that kind of a, in that kind of a trajectory. So I made smaller paintings and I still worked, with, sorry, and I still worked within um, topics of interest, which are popular culture and mask iconography and partying. And what you're seeing are a series, an old series. This is, my God, 17 years old. These are paintings of clowns wow. and clowns and mask making leads to my fascination from an early age with genre, horror and science fiction. So then they're ends up being a lot of monster imagery coming into play and delving into some abstractions of close examinations of monster masks wow. and weird configurations of cropping, fascinations with professional wrestling, which Ooh. would then segue into a later career in performance art and production. Huh. Uh, all these paintings then end up being I label them as diptychs. They're painted as squares. Squares become an interesting parameter for me that I, I'm mm. still fascinated with. Uh, I would juxtapose them together. Have these images inverted, flipped around, or looked at from not their most uh, conservative or traditional viewpoint. Could have fun interplay. I see that I'm unstable, so I'm going to be awfully slow and methodic in my explanations. But all these colorful examinations of masks and of monsters, uh, it was a means to an end. It was to get another gallery solo show and to get into new collector base. And I felt I was serving a, a market master, if you will, while still trying to stay true to myself. And I'll be completely blunt, uh, the work didn't didn't move. It sold a little better than the large, larger than life pieces, but I wasn't getting into a, a collector base as quickly as I wanted. There could be a lot of reasons for that, but I felt after this second 
solo exhibit of mine in a commercial setting. It was really uh, disappointing and I don't want to say humiliating, but it was one of those reality checks. Thankfully, I have always been an educator. I am committed to arts education and began an, as an art teacher professionally early 1997. I've been teaching for 25 years. Um, I'm a big uh, advocate of the profession and chose that first before becoming a practicing artist. I mentioned this because of that stability from the healthcare received from being an art teacher. I said, I don't need to, I don't need to feel so beholden to market demand. I just started making things that I was genuinely interested in. So I made a huge series of works based off of one of my favorite movies. I felt no issue with the threat of copyright infringement because the film in question was in the public domain. It was the 1959 classic from William Castle Productions starring Vincent Price, House on Haunted Hill. Uh, so I used the film and in particular the film sets. Uh, there is a bit of a connection to architecture there and that the exterior shots of the film are done um, at a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Because this is, I think, one of your unique uh, approaches to making paintings for these, the, the haunted, uh, House of the Haunted Hill paintings. Sure. These paintings then should look radically different from what I started with because they are remarkably minimal. Uh, House on Haunted Hill, as theatrically distributed, was in black and white. Now, if you go to any streaming service, you may find a colorized version. That's the bastardized version. Don't watch that. You might find some remakes and they're kind of uh, entertaining for what remakes are, but the original film was in black and white. So I would take these uh, black and white stills. I would take uh, any panning shots of those interior or exterior shots, stitch them together. And from those uh, references, I would make these elaborate drawings and those drawings would be put onto canvas. Put on the canvas, I wasn't working with uh, white gesso. I decided to tone all of my gesso in pastel colors. It's just the way that I've been developing portraits um, for, for decades. And then I would develop a grisaille on top of the ground pastel gesso with titanium white. I would do this with any painting. And in fact, the painting behind me, I'm working on a portrait commission, is being developed in the exact same way. I made some conceptual leap with this House on Haunted Hill series that I wanted to stay beholden to the source images of being in black and white, but I wanted there a little, I wanted to inject a little bit of fiction, which would be a little shot of color, and it would be a pastel. So there's a bit of a contradiction. It's a bit of an oxymoron that. deceit and uh, manipulation. And here I am manipulating film stock onto a canvas using only white paint on top of a colored ground. So this is just a lot of value study. I say grisaille, grisaille is a French painting of just being a gray painting, but there's no black here. This is just purely tints of white on top of a colored ground. Uh, in some ways then it could be argued that these are half finished paintings or they're not fully resolved. I was trying to reconcile that in my own head that these, these presented were, were in fact complete. I would use the opportunity then also to inject some text in several of the works. And that became a recurring motif for me that you'll see with some later images. Um, didn't necessarily need the text to be legible, but I wanted there to be clues. And in this case, all of the text seen was from typography used in the film's promotion. I had 11, no, I had 10 of these paintings developed for a show in uh, Transformer. No, that's not right. Flashpoint. So Flashpoint Gallery, downtown DC, they decided to host these exhibits, or excuse, excuse me, host these paintings. And I made it a remarkably large performative, uh, it, there was a performative element that just got completely out of control. I dressed up as Vincent Price. I made a scavenger hunt throughout the city. 
I invited VIPs with small caskets delivered in the mail that had invitations rolled up in a skull ring. It was just absolute madness. I had a blast, um, but it may have, it, I guess it started to leap as a launching pad for my um, growing persona as being something more of an interdisciplinary artist, that these weren't just paintings, they weren't just drawings, but there was also a performative element and there's also a productive element as in the promotion of the show was just as important which I think was a nice ode to William Cass where I was going with any of this is that I painted uh, I wanted to show you a panoramic piece and then really we need to get away from this series um I made here we go I made 10 paintings I wanted to have 13 paintings 13 was a big deal to me because of how unlucky the number is. So I ended up grabbing some lobby cards. Lobby cards were early promotions in the mid 20th century to promote movies. Um, smaller in scale than a traditional movie poster that would be hung outside of theaters, but they were larger than say postcards. So I would get vintage lobby cards and I would use the same idea, but this time with acrylic, I would mask out most of the content of the lobby card with either text or with design. And these are just text and design called from the film itself. Doing that on paper kind of blew my mind and made me realize that this is probably worth exploring and maybe I don't have to deal anymore with, well, maybe I don't need to deal with paint exclusively. So that led to me just making stuff with paper. I made a choice in 2006, 2000, 2006 to 2012, I decided to fully embrace my growing midlife crisis, uh, not by a convertible or by uh, a said by and childhood toys. So thank, thank the DC Commission of the Arts and Humanities for the grants. And thanks to eBay, I was able to reclaim a lot of my childhood toys. And I should stop screen share for one hot moment because this is going to be important. I got this. This is my first toy that I have the strongest recollection of ever playing with. It was a drawing toy. Uh, my father was very supportive of having my mother take me away. <laughs> and then my mother would placate me by buying me crap. And it, dad would like it if I got crap that would end up facilitating me making stuff. So here I have a drawing toy. And if you're not familiar with this drawing toy, it's the best drawing toy of all time. It may look similar to say this, which came out technically first. This is called fashion plates. This came out in the mid 70s it was meant for girls. gender uh, the 70s i'm born in 75 fashion plates is uh, a plastic version of paper dolls we have uh, extremities represented in four different types of plastic paneling we have legs we have torsos we have heads representing various fashion choices of the decade I never had fashion plates as a boy. Instead, I had the boy version. Mighty, mighty men and monster maker. So I have the same premise. I would take a plastic plate with a low, <laughs> with a good catch ninja. Uh, I would take a plate with a low relief plastic uh, lip of say alien legs and I would put that against robot arms and then I would put it against a vampire head. I'd, I would place these plates on this bed, I'd set a and then I do a crayon rubbing. It's copy work, but it allowed me to do mashups. And I just had a blast. And months later, my mom found another one. It was just specifically robots. So I was dealing with monsters and robots from age three. Loved it. Middle age crisis, bought them over again. And then I started buying the girl versions. 30 sets later, I had 
hundreds and hundreds of these plastic plates that I was just making different configurations of. You do a crayon rubbing and they're, they're bloody awful. You can't see them, they're, they're fuzzy, they're not terribly well uh, articulated. You need, you, what are you gonna do with this information? I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, if you can see, well, I guess I did that prematurely. If you can look at my little face over on the side, I have my master plan. So within our hundreds and hundreds of drawings that I've made based on these transfer rubbings. And my goal was simple, gender bending. I wanted to mash up not what I had been doing as a boy between robots and monsters, but I wanted to mash up between girl plates and boy plates. And whew, this was a this was a deep dive. I went down the rabbit hole and I made dozens and dozens of these and they found traction and I got some nice shows out of them and I made some nice sales and they went into a really large and wide collector base. And what medium are these were uh, besides paper? Like what medium are you, are you constructing them with? This will be a nice tie into what I'm doing currently. Um, they're relatively easy images to digest. If any of you saw that, you're like, what, what is this? So Jordan's question is prudent. Um, these are mixed media. The substrate is a dense board. I don't know if it's foam core, it's not foam core, but it's some cold press board in which I've mounted scrapbooking paper. I wanted to make certain that this body of work was very much um, riffing on the hobby industry. The toys themselves were very pedestrian and mass marketed and meant for a child's touch. I find most of the products in our suburban hobby shops are similar and it kind of perpetuates to a, a later stage of life where you do it all over again, but with scrapbooking. Uh, I'm fascinated with the, with the, with the market of, of scrapbooking. Um, and it's not necessarily positive, but I was attracted to these scrapbooking pages. So I would use these as a mount and then I would take my drawings, place the drawings on top. How? By making the drawings on cardstock, coloring the cardstock, cutting the cardstock off, mounting them onto the paper, and then painting them again from there. This could have been done in Illustrator in like five minutes. Instead, I chose this completely maniacal process that would take like six hours a piece. It makes no bloody sense, but I did it hundreds of times. And then I would put it in this remarkably archival gallery issued frame and sell them for hundreds of dollars. It's just madness. What the hell am I doing? I still have like 30 of them left and they're being sold on a song if anybody wants them. <laughs> uh, but it was time to finally put that body of work to rest. So where did I go from there? I went back to the mine of my childhood and realized that, oh, I was, um, I was raised in an engineering firm. I was also raised again on genre. So I went to my, one of my favorite franchises, Star Wars, rooted through my collection of things and found a little portfolio of Star Wars blueprints. These are prop masters blueprints from the first film's production. They slapped a new label on them, called them Star Wars Blueprints, and they were sold in every B. Dalton bookstore throughout the late 70s and early 80s. And I bought one and I kept it. And then I decided decades later that I would destroy them by masking them off and putting graphic color schemes on top of them. And they're fairly easy to digest. They're really punchy and saturated. And they were a hell of a lot of fun to make. They were materials. I have these impossible creases that can't be remedied. You can't steam these. These are truly vintage sheets of paper. These pieces of paper are over 40 years old. So there's some trial and error about how to work around that and what kind of masking agents you're using and 
it becomes a it becomes a complication. But what a fun exercise for me. Took it to the next logical um, franchise, which I also owned a book of blueprints for, which was then Star Trek. And just playing around with simple color theory, trying to complement what the designers were doing in their print, but not taking the smallest design element from the blueprint and just leaning into it and making it that much more. Drew, you, you mentioned earlier that about um, with the House and Haunted Hill that you have no worries about copyright infringement uh, because it was in the public domain. Uh, I don't, are these not in public domain? So brilliant question, right? They're not, absolutely. Paramount still owns Star Trek and Disney owns Star Wars. So how do I skirt the law in this instance? One, I've never been, no one's passed me a cease and desist letter yet. They certainly could, but my argument after citing a couple of lawsuits that Jeff Koons had to go through in the 80s is that I'm dealing, and you know, to a lesser extent, uh, Shepard with his Obama poster, um, I feel I'm altering the original source material enough that it can no longer serve its original intent. This blueprint, this blueprint as presented to us now can't really be deciphered. Um, also, are off pieces. I'm taking truly relics from my childhood, these out of print blueprints, still copyrighted, but out of print sheets of paper, and I'm slapping paint on them. So that's a bit of a, some could argue that that's a really weak ass uh, defense, but I think it's, I think it'll hold up. And so far, I haven't been called out on it. Does that kind of answer your question? Yep. Great. I'll serve my, uh, your subpoena later. <laughs> Thank you. I would take it a bit further to, um, well, what, this is a return to lobby, car lobby cards. They're just um, larger and this time shown as a triptych. Um, where should I take this? Where should I take this? Oh, so let's head off to a convergence, if we will. Um, I'll go back to paintings for one hot second. which was a peculiar little co-op gallery in Northwest. Uh, a lot of fun. It was above the runway, runway bar, and it was called Small Works. I needed to create small works. They needed to be less than 20 inches. And I was going through my sketchbooks and realized that I had developed a lot of plans for me revisiting my uh, monster mask fascination. And in particular, um, my lifelong interest in Ben Cooper costumes. These are the costumes popularly sold at Woolworth, Woolsworth in the, in the mid to late part of the 20th century. These were the vinyl costumes that have a single piece of PVC plastic. Um, I would take that premise that was then parodied on The Simpsons with a fun exchange between characters Lisa and Milhouse where it's just ridiculous. You got a kid wearing a vinyl costume of a character and then they're wearing a, a mask of the same character. So there's this weird redundancy and it's, it's just bizarre. So I would use that as a launching part, uh, launching pad and I would do this weird bit of cropping to counter the redundancy. So I would have some sort of character image on my chest mimicking the vinyl costume. And then I would have the mask of that character I would crop them at the eye line and I would do um, self portraits. What had been two portraits to begin with, uh, Dracula and Frankenstein's monster ended up becoming a multi-year pursuit where I just did a lot of characters for all the masks and all the t-shirts that I owned. So tapping into every fascinating superhero or monster that uh, I adored um, as a, child as a young man as an old man I just had a I just had a blast and occasionally I'd put my friends in the costumes tightly cropping making it a little I mean, there's a I guess a 
unsettling violence to cropping a face at the eye line. And Andrew, would you comment on how, why you switch to oil? Is that a more comfortable medium where you can express more or what do you think, what, what was in your mind about that from the scrapbooking? That theory? is a perfectly valid question. And um, the answer is a bit more convoluted. Let's see. I became a painter in 1997 because I got a job. I became, so I graduated from um, Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania with a newly minted degree in art education. And I got a job as an art educator and I left my studio at the college where I was a printmaker and I was a sculptor. Okay. So I ended up getting, uh, I ended up getting a rental in a row house with a roommate and I don't have a studio and I can't afford a studio. And I need a studio if I'm a printmaker or I'm a sculptor and I don't have that. So what the hell am I gonna do? I'm an artist, I need to make some images. So I make some drawings, it was kind of unsatisfying. The, I can take this one room and I can paint. So it was logistics and pragmatics and practicality. And I just decided if I wanna make things and I don't have means to do these things, I can do this thing. And that thing was paint. So I started to paint and I wasn't a very good oil painter. Arguably, I'm not one now, but I, I like the process and I like the feel and the viscosity of the paint. And I liked how slow it was and it felt like the antithesis of the, the computer age and the scare of Y2K. Uh, what was that yeah. scare at the yeah. turn of the century? I don't know. I don't know. But yes, it was. I put myself yeah. in a small room and I painted with oils and I loved it. And I decided that I wanted to do this for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank Years you. later, though, it would turn out that um, as much as I love oil painting, the way I developed as a painter and the choices I make in my painting's development is a very long process. It's, labor, it's laborious and it's uh, maddening with the level of production or the time of production. It'll take me weeks and months to finish an indirect painting that has a lot of buildup with glazes. Um, and I needed a Honestly, I needed a bigger and faster dopamine hit. So that's when the work on paper came into play. I was able to, I mean, those would take time. It's not like I yeah. could just rapid fire those out, but I could finish those in days where the Wolfman would take weeks. And I'm doing this for my own satisfaction, everybody. I needed to make myself happy. And um, this werewolf painting brings me joy, but sometimes, you know, I need to, get happier faster. <laughs> I, I, that actually brings in another question for me, which is do you find there is more of a, a um, not, not sales response, but do you find that, well, I, let's, say, let's say sales, do you think you sell more of the pains that you enjoy and you do for yourself more than if you try to do a body work that is marketable? Does that make sense? That's a good question. Uh, I guess like what I'm saying is I'm looking for it. If you do something you like, do you find that more people will enjoy it uh, the same way or you'll find more of a uh, commonality with other people who have the same joy and therefore you're more likely to sell the piece? I think I'm trying to be probably too diplomatic in my, in my thinking out a response. Uh, I think people respond to honesty. Yeah. That said, you can take things a bit too far and those weird fractured self-portraits of, of me as monsters and superheroes. Some of those were very good paintings and some of them aren't very good. Um, they're all completely honest. And I all have a, con I have a connection to each of those characters in some form or fashion. There's a bit of a, an identity attraction to each of those. But at the end of the day, you're asking someone to, to buy a portrait of the artist. So that, is a that's a weird marketplace to be to be striving towards. Um, I many are in nice collections. I'm very grateful for that support, but I also have quite a few of those in inventory. Um, so be wary of, <laughs> of artists painting themselves. Uh, I'm no Rembrandt, and they're they're very 
they could be construed as shallow and superficial and a little too poppy and dismissive. Like, oh, this is a, this is a guy who's way who's into cosplay too much. These smaller works, um, they may lend themselves better to, to my marketplace because they're less expensive and they're smaller. It may be that simple. Um, I'm still, I feel, dealing with the same kind of um, crowd and that I'm asking someone to pick up this piece and this piece as a, as a diptych because they're fascinated with both the the franchise in question, but also maybe some of the, maybe some of the interpretation of the text or what the, what the support is. In these cases, I deviated from blueprints and worked in another relic of childhood, which would be scholastic books um, of my preferred franchises teaching me about science and computers. So I would just pour up my old books and I painted on top of pages from my childhood. Out of context, you don't necessarily need to read that page text to understand the, the graphic design or the characters I left intact, but sometimes the text can come into play and it's fun. I'll leave with uh, this last body of work that I have been developing for the past 12 months and then I will shut up and take any or every question that you may have for me. I was invited to curate an exhibit at Pyramid Atlantic Art Center in Hyattsville. Um, I was very flattered to be considered and it had some inherent challenges. Namely, it was going to be done quickly. I was asked in January, the show had to be mounted in May. I was given a directive, they wanted it to be based around games, and the director of the center uh, identified me as a lifelong gamer and a pretty passionate one at that, and we had a working relationship together. If you have business space, do so. It's a great institution, and she and I also um, cut our teeth with her production company, Astro Pop Events, which is what Jordan had been alluding to earlier. I do a lot of weird theatrical stuff. So she says, Andrew, we wanna do a show on games. I said, one, can I curate myself into the exhibit? <laughs> she said, yes. And I'm like, I don't give me, nepotism be damned. I'm gonna put myself in this exhibit. And two, can I focus it in on a aspect of gaming, like cartography? She said, I don't know what that means, but sure. So I invited a bunch of artists from around the country that had images of board game iconography that was also slightly oriented towards maps. When you think about it, uh, a lot of gaming is done on some sort of um, structured parameter that has rules and regs. So just in the two images I've shared, classic board game, but here we have what a sporting arena, like an, a, a hockey could also be interpreted as this map. So with my work, I took scrapbooking paper again. And instead of cropping it like I had done previously with these um, fashion plate mashups, I mounted the paper to board, trying to keep the scrapbooking paper's dimensions intact. It's 12 by 12 inches. And then I would go back to my fascination with overlaying text, and I would put text on top of these gaming maps and the gaming maps with the text would then be this new sense of mashup which would also have this level of snarkiness and kind of an uh, kind of a connection to the instantaneous and yet dismissive internet meme era in which we live so a lot of these are um kind of cheeky and kind of sardonic and kind of ironic um the tongue is firmly planted in my cheek as I make any of these, and they've offended uh, their fair share of people, this one in particular, and others have been just completely pleased as punch, and they take ones that are, um, they, they just, they gravitate to the ones that 
that speak to them. Nostalgia reigns supreme in this case. And these have gone into a lot of collectors' homes. I'm grateful for it. Um, where, I, where I end is that um, Alita Anderson Art Projects took several of these to the Affordable Art Fair last weekend where they got a lot of eyeballs. They didn't necessarily go into new, to new homes. So I'll be retrieving my leftover inventory from these. Um, but the same gallery also took a lot of my latest blueprint pieces, which then is a, a new configuration of both my fascination with blueprints, my fascination with sci-fi genre, they're, they're Star Trek blueprints, but now I've also um, heavily leaned into text. So there's a lot of internet meme-esque phrasing that's done on the blueprints, which I suppose I can show those to you hot quick. And then I promise I'll shut up. So folded sheets of paper, this time not the late seventies, but printed in the mid nineties, where I've uh, overlaid, I've juxtaposed a coloring book page or a coloring book inspired page on top of the blueprint. I've thrown some text on there and they just become these weird new entities. And as much as I have focused a lot of this talk on work on paper behind me uh, is what I'm doing this afternoon, which is working on a new portrait commission that I need to deliver in a few weeks. And it's, it's oil on linen. And all this said, I didn't have to talk about my production career or my performance career at all. Aww. I mean, I can if anybody wants to ask, but let's keep I don't know. That's weird. I thought we'd be down to, <laughs> we'd be down to less than half a dozen by now. Anybody out there? Yes, all of us. I don't see anyone crying, so that's <laughs> yeah. good. That's good. <laughs> Drew, do you find it hard to switch gears from one one yeah. body of work to another, or is it pretty seamless? Yes, it's it's challenging. Um, there's a level of logistics that makes it difficult. It was trickier before when the home, when the studio was in the home. So for Okay. For 15 years, my studio was my spare bedroom. And that's a modest footprint. We're dealing with like 10 by 10 feet. And when you're dealing with very, very different materials with very, very different setups, oil painting requires an entirely different studio setup than airbrushing, than work on paper. Yeah. That's less now because I've been kicked out of my home studio uh, I'm now in a new space, which was my former garage. Um, this is now a really a, a, a pretty awesome studio. I'm, I'm happy to be here. And the Wi-Fi connection has, it's been unstable, but it seems like you're still hearing me. It's cool. the, the, problem still main, the problem still exists in that um, I have one station over here for oil painting. I have another station for work on paper. I have another station for framing. So there's a logistic problem. Mentally less so. I end up keeping most things um, recorded in a journal. I'm a big journaler. Um, really? It's less about images as it is note taking. So I'm a, I'm a big note taker. I'm looking frantically around for my notebook. And it's not here and now I feel like I'm missing my crutch. But I have my notes. So I can I resort to my notes about what brainstorming happened when and what materials would be required and what would what material would best fit for that uh, it's, it's truly one of those dances where I just have to embrace who I am and I'm premeditated. Um, I'd be a really good serial killer until I'd be caught and that would happen immediately because I'm so premeditated. And um, that's a real dark twist on this. Where, where, I'm, where I'm trying to go with this is, I'm very much a plan your work, work your plan kind of guy. There's little deviation or little room for spontaneity with anything that I do. Um, mm. I make certain that any of the work that I'm producing is conceived and um, developed in the, 
in the blueprint phase uh, at the point of conception, and then it's just a matter of execution. Uh, and yeah. when I get to the execution point, well, then that's I, I just become a machine. Interesting. You're really an engineer. <laughs> it seems. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was about to say that. <laughs> Uh, like but crazy. as the mind of an architect and engineer. Yes. <laughs> Do you miss like having those happy accidents that I, I think you know typically happen with a, an oil painter who doesn't have a clear plan or clear idea what right. have, what's going to happen in the end? Does that does that bother you that you know when you think of an yeah. idea? It, it turns yeah, out I wish I could. Do you have happy? Accidents? I don't know if I wish that, but that's just not the way my brain works. It would be interesting to know if I could respond well to happenstance and uh, um, I'll say it again, spontaneity. Yeah, and like plain air. I, I, allow, I try and allow very little of that to, uh, to happen. If a mistake occurs, uh, that's how I perceive it. It's a mistake and it needs to be corrected. Oh. Every once in a blue moon, something may happen on a design on a design issue that I just kind of embrace. Like perhaps I mask out an area with too much paint. Maybe it becomes a little too opaque. I wanted it to be more translucent, but now I'm just going to embrace that extra coverage. But that's about it. Um, I yeah. lean back. Oh, I threw them out. That's horrible. I made a piece. Uh -huh. So this is... I'm looking through the my rejects. Um, sure. These are beautiful panels. I like them a lot. They're 12 by 12, which is perfect for the formatting of scrapbooking paper. Uh, I started deviating from my original conceit, which was uh, gaming and uh, cartography, and started to deal more with pop culture and theater culture specifically. So this piece was one of my first in, in this weird tangent where I was using typography from the Broadway musical Cats. So I'm just like, this is low hanging fruit. Okay, okay, I'm sorry if you like cats. <laughs> but I end up doing this on top of a darkened theater and there was just a, there was a couple imperfections in the paper and the way the paint was applied and the way some of my frisket was lifting and pulling some of the color and it's, it's garbage. Uh, I now need to reclaim this board. So it's a matter of me not this will never in public strip this board sand it down and, and do it over again or i'll say f it and i'll just throw it out or burn it it's a 15 dollars panel it's archival it's nice but is it worth the two hours of labor it'll take me to reclaim this to a, a fresh start mm -hmm. i don't know my meltdown two weeks ago is i was having so many material failures i i'm embarrassed to say but I'll confess to you all, uh, I melted, I threw the panels on the floor and I threw my foot through them. Um, I just smashed the shit out of like six panels and it was two dozen hours of work and like $200 worth of materials. And I was just beside myself because I chose a different brand of material that I wasn't familiar with and I should have done some test samples. I didn't. I did things in an assembly line with this new material with failed or combination thereof, or maybe I'm stupid about who the hell knows, but it sucked. Mm. I couldn't course correct it. I yeah. smashed it all to hell. You could have used that as a performance piece. Do you still do performance yes. pieces? <laughs> Thanks, Janice. Good question. Uh, what I did do, Michael, is I used it as an educational uh, moment, and I took the smashed work to campus, and I shared the with I shared it with my painting class, and just said, "Look, your professor does not have the answers, um, and he's not perfect, and this is a this is a lesson in studio failure, and I'm not I'm not proud of this moment, but I had a total meltdown, and I I smashed my work." I was making a work on top of a uh, image of Dr. Seuss. Um, the places you will go, it's a, it's a yeah. cliche, but you give this volume to people that are Graduated. reaching a, a milestone. Yeah. yeah. So I, I ended up putting text on it that says, you'll go to hell. Well, the piece ended yeah. up 
the piece ended up getting destroyed. So I, I, you know, I kicked my foot through it and I'm showing this to my students. <laughs> but I'm saying it looks better. <laughs> Oh my God, that's okay. You're cheeky students. Uh, it's in a landfill now. So Michael, performance, uh, you know, it was the early aughts. Performance was a thing, uh, especially in, in Washington, D.C. I thought I had a particular skill set that could be exploited. They were fun exercises and uh, I really treated most of it as bad theater, which I'm still involved with. I think yeah. there's a very fine line like, between performance art and shitty theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't mind walking that line. I don't do as many straight up fine art performance pieces anymore. I yeah. still do a lot of <laughs> bad theater. Build a coffin and my production it. companies, my production company, uh, I say my, the production company that still puts up with my crap and they choose to work with me. Their adage is they do theater, no, they do burlesque plus or theater minus. <laughs> it's just the most brilliant way to encapsulate what I what I do on that front. Um, right. I have two questions. Uh, just two, cool. In just two, Andrew. Uh, one is, do you do thumbnail sketches for the things you're going to to while you're planning and the second one is different is what do you like to teach as far as thumbnailing uh i'm embarrassed to say that i don't have my my crutch with me my my planner is moleskine i have been dealing with moleskines for the past 25 years it was hard to get them 25 years ago but i graduated from uh my early cult indoctrination with Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective oh, yeah. People. It was, it was the 90s, psychobabble yeah. and self-help was a thing. And I ended up having to buy into that crap with these expensive planners from Frank I know. I mean, Covey. Jesus, <laughs> why, why did I spend so much money on that yeah. garbage? Uh, so I went hey, to- you're next stop for art. <laughs> I have these Moleskine <laughs> planners and their you know, daily calendars. I drop my notes in there. And if I do any kind of sketching, it's remarkably, minimal, it's contour line, it's just a little ink drawing and I'm moving right. on. Uh, I've been teaching since 97. I fully acknowledge I don't have all the answers and I feel I've right. maybe developed a skill set to teach people the fundamentals and foundation level skills pretty well. So I like teaching Two-dimensional design, color theory and practice, oh. beginning painting. I think I would fall apart and be a complete mess if I were to instruct graduate students or... Uh, no or one should instruct graduate students. No. <laughs> how, how do you teach any of them, right? Like art yeah. cannot be taught, right? <laughs> like that book. Skills can. I have a great day job. It's at the College of Southern Maryland. Those fools gave me tenure. I'm a oh, professor. My next step is emeritus when I retire in 20 years. And I go to work every day with the biggest shit eating grin on my face. Cause I'm like, I get to go, I get to go into a studio that I manage and teach students color theory. It's yeah, wonderful. It's awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, it, and it's a kind of performance art too. Oh, well, yeah. All educators have to have uh, a little bit of that. Some level of acting and performance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not that I'm supposed to be an entertainer per se no, as an educator. It helps. <laughs> it helps some. You know, there are a lot of different learning styles and some people uh, gravitate towards my delivery and other people think it's obnoxious and they mm -hmm. would rather be taught by anybody else other than me. And that's fair. You know, there's a, it could be a cult of personality in that regard. Like, uh, students yeah. might take my class not because they want to learn a damn thing about color theory, but because, oh, he's teaching a general oh, education class and I can get an A and he's kind of funny. <laughs> it's great. I'd take, it. I'd take your class. Yeah, I would do. <laughs> Andrew, may I ask a question? Well, you, meant, when, um, you mentioned that you had 
a background in printmaking and sculpting. Um, I wanted to ask you if you would tell us a little bit about what you did as a printmaker. Uh, were you doing intaglio etching? Were you doing monotypes? How, what, how did that evolve? Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Give him a moment. Can you hear me? Rose and Andrew, start over. Okay. Can we hear me? Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. No, it's we, a little grandiose to it's grandiose for me to uh, really call myself a printmaker and sculptor as much as it is to me for, for me to stress to everyone that that was my field of study in mm -hmm. undergraduate school. So I was spending a lot of time in the printmaking lab, a lot of time in the sculpture lab. In the sculpture lab, I was making masks. I was casting heads and building prosthetics. And this was a kid in Northwest Pennsylvania who adored Tom Sabini and was my, my backup plan if I wasn't gonna become an art teacher was to go to Hollywood and work with latex. But I really liked the idea of additioning and I liked the idea of multiples and uh, science fiction horror nerd. I grew up with comic books and it all seemed to make sense when it came to printmaking and I liked screen printing. So um, I'll always appreciate multiple color block prints, but I spent a lot of time with screen prints and washing those damn things out. Um, it was screen printing by and large. If I have I to do. stand it in town, oh God, I don't, I don't want to talk about sanding down stones. It was screen printing. I love screen printing. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. I, I do have a Andrew Wazanski, uh Star Wars sculpture. Oh, wow. One thing I didn't share with the group this morning, uh, perhaps for good reason, uh, some of my other energies have been spent with curatorial efforts. Yeah, like I mentioned that with the with the games and cartography at Pyramid, but, um, you know, embracing geekdom, I would end up having hosts allow me to curate exhibits specifically about my favorite space opera, Star Wars. And as part of the promotional efforts, I, um, I made Star Wars salt dough ornaments using cookie cutters. Um, so people would go to the reception and they would see this large uh, holiday tree littered with handmade ornaments. And Michael has one of them. And it, it was just me like taking, one of my tropes is taking villains that are often depicted in a in a black wardrobe and making it pink so in that case it's whatever um vader's grandson in pink it's a treasured possession thank you I'm so jealous <laughs> uh well man um, we made it yeah, an hour our, our, i can't believe it i hope everyone um can get by and try and Erase this I, trauma. Love, I, I love your <laughs> graphics as well. Like your um, another time, maybe I can ask you about fonts and how you either mimic them or generate them and design. Well, I'll leave you with this. Uh, those works on panel, much like the works of me doing the, the fashion plates and how I was relaying the. Yeah. The, like, involvement those these pieces make yeah. no mistake you could make this yeah. on your printer in less than five minutes and you, so you designed the font so yeah so i'm choosing to take it in a remarkably homebrew ridiculous level of craftsmanship for something that doesn't demand that at all okay but you add a lot of craftsmanship to the rest of it, putting it together. I did, oh, keep a, I did keep a proxy sheet of that Dr. Seuss paper. So I think this will make a return at some point. I don't know when. Yeah. But uh, in a way, Andrew, that's, that's your statement. Um, you like to spend time doing something that some people would value a five minute print, but on the other hand, it's your craftsmanship and you're thinking on what you want to show in something that spends, you spend several days. 
So that's your statement. Just bring yeah. it to the public. That's very astute and considerate of you. Thank you. Uh, uh -huh. That's very much, that, that's accurate. Yeah. It might be a saving grace too, in that um, if anyone spots an imperfection, they could say, oh, wait, there's a little bit of a- That's intentional. There. Like, well, it's, it's handcrafted, it's boutique. Yeah, yeah. But um, I'm sorry that you are, um, when you teach, to, you teach um, in an art school, I teach in elementary kindergarten and the setting is very completely different. And then my, my thing is that any accident is an opportunity. So I don't know if you can say that to your crowd of people, but in a way, that that's the way we teach other kids, right? Because if everything is perfectionist, you don't get art education in small people. <laughs> a good it's lesson. very important that now we have a lot of virtual stuff that people get into the craft to do stuff. Interesting. Very. That's a really important statement to perhaps leave us with. Um, I commend you for being able to teach the youngest generations. And, um, you know, I cut my teeth in K through 12 teaching high schoolers for almost a decade. And it was, it's tough work. You were doing tough work. And the idea that you did tough work over a pandemic with elementary school art students is yes. just amazing. So props to you for staying uh, upright and still drawing breath into your lungs. That's great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my opportunity with failure, it's perhaps more indirect in that I did a real soul searching after I had my meltdown and realized, you know, uh, I need to exercise more. I need to drink less. I need to be a more patient <laughs> man. So that's where I'm growing. I'm like, 47 year old man child learning the basics all over again. And that's okay. And just as you become a father, too. <laughs> yeah. That's, okay. that's wonderful. Oh, oh we have something in the chat. Jordan, should we look at that real quick? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 I think they're mostly just people saying how amazing you are. Oh, well, that's. Yeah, that's extraordinarily great. talented. The college is honored to have him as faculty member and mentor to students. Really appreciate your sharing your reflection and process and your truth. That's Thank you for kind. sharing your creative works and process. <laughs> that's very really kind. enjoyed Thanks, hearing all of this. By all means, peel off, go do your Saturday. I'm gonna stick around until Jordan kicks me off. And I see my, my cousin here, that's crazy. <laughs> from California joining us. It's all family there. Oh, like how wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Thank you, Andrew.